All right, here's a summary of Snell's law. So I'm gonna consider an incident beam here, an incident light ray, and it makes some angle theta one with respect to the normal. And I've drawn this uh, gray line here, which is a normal line. Normal simply means that it's perpendicular to the surface, which I've drawn here in black. So my incident light ray is coming in and it makes some angle theta one with respect to uh, the normal. First of all, part of that light is going to be reflected. It's gonna be reflected here. And this angle that it makes is actually also equal to theta one. Because that it is our law of reflection. Whatever the incident angle has to be equal to the reflected angle. Now, light number one we're gonna say is, or the incident light rather, is in medium one. And I'm gonna say that that medium here has an index of refraction, N1. Part of that light now not only is reflected, but part of it might be refracted, which means it's going to be transmitted inside the other material. What I'm calling medium two, that one's gonna be characterized with an index N2. So let's have a look at what happens now. And again, now I can define an, uh, another angle. This angle over here, let's call it theta two. Theta two is the angle that the transmitted light or the refracted light uh, makes with respect to that normal line that I drew originally. Now, refracted is just another word for saying that light will bend, right? Notice that if I continue this green line here, let's continue that green line in a straight line, try to make it as straight as possible. It doesn't continue along a straight line, right? I could see that this red light ray here, I drew it at a different angle. And whenever you have a change of index of refraction, you're going to have a different angle. So now we have two cases to consider. I can either have the index N2 bigger than N1 or I can have it smaller than N1. We're gonna look at both of those cases here. So let me just write this out. Cases that we're gonna look at. Uh, case number one is gonna be when the index N2 is bigger than N1. That's actually the case I drew here. And case number two is the opposite when the index of refraction of medium one is going to be smaller than N2. Now, in order to apply Snell's law, we have to remember what Snell's law is, and this is what Snell's law says. It says that the product of the index, N1, multiplied with sine of my angle, and again, it's the angle with respect to the normal, so in this case, sine of theta one, has to be equal to N2 sine of theta two. This is Snell's law which also means that the product of the index and sine of the angle has to be equal to a constant. All right, so let's see what that means now for our two specific cases. Let's apply Snell's law. And I'm gonna consider an incident light that is in air uh, for the first case going into water. And for the second case, I'm gonna consider an incident light that's going from water into air. So let's do both of those cases. All right, so here's case number one. I have index two, which is water, and that's approximately 1.33, which is bigger than the index of air. I have an incident angle of 30 degrees. So applying Snell's law to this case is pretty straightforward. We have uh, one for the index of air multiplied by sine of 30 degrees has to be equal to 1.33, the index N2, multiplied by sine of the angle two, theta two. So we can solve this. Sine of 30 is approximately one half. So you're going to get that theta two is our sine of one multiplied by a half, sine of 30 degrees divided by 1.33. Substitute that in your calculator. You think you should get something that's approximately 22 degrees. So let's go ahead and draw that. So if this one's 30, this angle here actually ends up being smaller. And this here is the angle theta two, which is 22 degrees. So when you go from a low index to a high index, the refracted angle is always smaller than the incident angle, okay? Now again, you're always gonna have a bit of light that is reflected, so let's not forget that, Ray, that's also very important. And this one, we know the angle, it's also going to be 30 degrees. So this is what Snell's law looks like. Take one specific case where there is no refraction is if the incident angle is, 30, is zero degrees, sine of zero, you're also gonna get the 
sine of theta two is also going to be zero for that case. All right, so for case number two now, we're gonna go from, well, high index, we're gonna go from water to air, we're gonna consider the same incident angle of 30, and let's apply Snell's law to that case. Again, we can right away, we could do, there's gonna be part of that light that's going to be reflected. That reflected light is also gonna be at 30 degrees. But now really what we wanna do is we wanna calculate what the refracted light is going to do. What is going to be the angle of the refracted light with respect to uh, this normal? Again, I just kind of continued the green line here. It's not going to continue along that green line. I just wanna show that if it was completely undeflected, if there was no change in index of refraction, that's what it would do, just propagate in the straight line. But now we will know that it's going to be refracted at a different angle. So let's apply Snell's law. Snell's law says, N1 sine theta one. N1 for this case now is the top one, it's 1.33. So we get 1.33 multiplied by sine of 30 degrees. Has to be equal to N2, which in this case is air, multiplied by sine of, again, theta two. So theta two is arc sine. Let's just write it as sine of the minus one here. of 1.33 multiplied by sine of 30 degrees. At the end, this gives us approximately 41.7 degrees. So we came in at 30 degrees, but now the refracted light ends up being refracted at an angle that's bigger, that's 30 degrees. So I have to make that angle bigger like that. Well, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit here. And this is the angle theta two, that's 41.7. So there it is. So you see when you go from a low index or from a high index to a low index, you get a bigger angle than what the incident angle was. That's kind of an interesting case. All right, there's a couple other interesting or important things that happen when light goes from one media to another, okay? And that is what happens to the speed? What happens to the speed V1 versus V2? And what happens to the wavelength? And what about the frequency? So all we've dealt with right now is we dealt with what happens to the angle inside the different media. But now we can also compare um, other quantities as well that have to do with the wave. All right, so let's consider a kind of a red light going in air. And that means that the wavelength of one is going to be approximately say 630 nanometers. Now we know if it's air, the speed V1 is going to be approximately equal to the speed of light in vacuum. That's three times 10 to the eight meters per second. And if I go ahead and calculate the frequency, again, I can get the frequency because I know the speed is the wavelength multiplied by the frequency. Therefore, the frequency of light in air is going to be approximately 4.76 times 10 to the 14 hertz. All right, so I've characterized at least the speed, the wavelength, and the frequency here in air. Now let's see what happens in medium two. So the first thing that's important is that the frequencies do not change when air goes from one media to another. Those frequencies have to be the same. So remember that. Now, if the frequency is the same, well, that means if I take my little wave equation over here, and I isolate for the frequency, that means that the frequency F1 is the speed divided by the wavelength, which is equal to the speed in medium two divided by the wavelength in medium two. However, I know that the speed of light in any medium with an index, it's always equal to, remember what we had, it's always equal to the speed of light in vacuum divided by that particular index. And likewise, the speed in medium two is the speed of light in vacuum divided by the index of that material. So I can simplify this expression over here. So instead of V1, let me write that as the speed of light in vacuum divided by the index N1. And I still have lambda one, the wavelength in medium one. This here equals to C2, N2 times lambda two. Now the C's are the same on both sides. They're simply the speed of light in vacuum. At the end, you're left with this expression over here. Both of those have to be equal to each other. That's an important equation. 
So you have to have that N1 lambda 1 must be equal to N2 lambda 2. So right away we know quite a bit of information about what's going on in the water here. We know that the frequency F2 is going to be 4.76 times 10 to the 14. I can write that down. What else? Again, that's in, measured in hertz. I also know that the speed of the wave inside this material, that's going to be V2, is going to be 3 times 10 to the 8, the speed in vacuum, divided by the index of refraction, which is 1.33. So my speed V2 of this particular wave here in water is going to be, if I substitute the numbers in the calculator, I think I get 2.25 times, again, 10 to the 8 meters per second. And the last thing I need is to find what the wavelength is. The wavelength in air, I told you, was approximately 630 here. Therefore, I can calculate what the wavelength inside medium 2 is. I simply divide what the value is in air, and I divide by the index. So you see what's going to happen here is that the larger the index, the smaller the wavelength. So in this case... Uh, lambda 2, our wavelength in medium 2, is simply equal to the index N1, the wavelength in air, which was 630. I'll just keep things in nanometers. And divided by the index 2, which is 1.33. So our wavelength in water for this particular wave was approximately, this is, gives you about 474 nanometers. Okay, so a few important things about refraction. Not only does this angle get smaller when I go from a low index to a high index, but the wavelength also gets smaller. The speed gets smaller, the frequency stays the same. So there's something really important that happens when you go from high index, from high N to low N. Like the case we did over here from water to air. So we went from an index of 1.33 toward 1. Now, let's make a little chart here of what happened. So let's consider the incident angle. We did one specific case before, that was theta 1, and then we calculated what theta 2 was. We did 30 degrees. When we did 30, deg 30 degrees, we obtained a refracted angle equal to 41.7. Now, if I go in my calculator and I do another case, if you do 40 degrees, for example, at 40 degrees, you get approximately 58.7. I did a couple more if I did 45 degrees. At 45 degrees, I get approximately equal to 70, I think. Yeah. So look what happens here. When my incident light, again, theta 1 was this angle over here. When the incident light is coming, the refracted light is always bigger. That angle is always bigger. This one's 45. This guy over here is 70 degrees. And look what happens for one more case over here. What if I did 48.753? You'll see why in a minute I picked that number. 48.753. I get a refracted angle that is basically approximately 90 degrees. So that's an interesting case. If theta 1 here is 48.753, that means that my refracted angle looks like this. That angle is 90 degrees. That's the angle, 90 degrees. This is what they call total internal reflection. Now remember, I'm still going to have part of the light that is reflected, and it's going to be reflected at the same angle, theta 1. But there is no light that's going to penetrate in the air over here, because the refracted angle is 90 degrees. I can't go any bigger than this using Snell's law. You're going to find an error in your calculator. But you can get all the way to 48.753. And the way I found that, again, if you apply Snell's law to this problem, so again, we're going to find what is this critical angle. So our index N1 is 1.33. And really, we want to find what is this critical angle where I'm going to get a refracted angle equal to 90 degrees. N2 for this case was 1, and now I get sine of 90 degrees. If you solve this equation, you're going to get that the critical angle. For these two media, again, it's arc, sine, 
of 1 over 1.33. Sine of 90 is 1, so you don't have to worry about that. And here you get 48.753 degrees. So that's the critical angle, and that's what they call total internal reflection. All right, that's it for today, folks. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comment, just leave them below, and I'll make sure to get back to you.